it's tough. It's like you said, you gotta say goodbye to something you cherish and love. And for me, it was like, shoot, that's that's how I made my living. Now I gotta rethink and I was good at it. Like I didn't. <laughs> what am I now, gonna do now? Exactly. Welcome to the Luke Branquino Show. My next guest is somebody that was a mainstay in the PBR for many years and, and had an amazing career and unfortunately injury cut it short, which happens unfortunately in bull riding and any sport of rodeo really. But uh, Stetson Lawrence, thanks for joining us, man. I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. So 10 times the PBR finals, um, man, that's that's impressive just in itself, but what you've seen in those 10 years from the first year you qualified to, to, you know, to last year, I mean, that, that'd be some changes that, that were pretty impressive. Yeah, it was very, it was crazy. The changes that when I first came on, it was just kind of, if you had the tools to make it there, you made it. <laughs> and nowadays shoot they're they're training from young age in the gym and all that and working at it as a very young age and, you can see it now, and like John Cranber and all them young guys coming up there, it's exciting to watch. And yeah, it's the sport's growing crazy over the last ten years or so. Well, not I mean, you you hit the nail on the head. You watch these kids from ten years to now on how their work ethic. You know what it what you could win in the PBR and and rodeo in general. They're treating it as a sport. They're going to the gym. They're eating healthier. And not saying bull riders weren't doing that to, uh, to you know ten years ago, but I know steer wrestlers weren't doing it as much ten years ago. Yeah, you know? now there there's maybe five bull riders doing that ten years ago. But <laughs> as the remember the old ones that get older in their career, the young guys shoot. They weren't doing that stuff. They're just worried right. about being rock stars and having a good time. <laughs> well, and you see it now, especially with the PBR teams and social media. You know, it really gets to expose that that side of the of the sport but you know you, you see these teams they have actual trainers that show up and the teams work out with them the athletes work out with them and I guess when when you're investing that much into a person just like any professional sport you want to have the best trainer there possible yeah no it's great to see like that and like you're saying having a trainer there just, I never knew anything about working out when I started shoot I was just riding bulls and next thing you know I was like holy cow like this will elevate my game and make me stay on tour longer. And it did. And yeah, it's crazy to see what it's gone to now. And yeah, the money you can win nowadays is insane. And even at the amateur levels, you can win a lot yeah. more. So it's. Well, and you, and you said it again there, you know, all you did was ride bulls and all I did was steer wrestle. But to me, you have to have your body in that shape. I mean, you could take anybody that is an athlete from another sport you take a football player and say, and your size, height, weight, you know, balance, all that. But, okay, go get on a bull. Well, I promise yeah. you, when they get on the same amount of bulls as you do, they're not going to be able to walk the next day, whether it's a practice bull or a rank one, because their body doesn't know how to handle that. And and I, I've always loved having kids come out that were, you know, high school athletes. I want to start steer wrestling, I'm, you know, and I'm in the best shape. I could I could outdo anybody. Yeah. The, all right, well, we run about five steers on the ground, and they're puking on the fence. <laughs> and I'm overweight, hefty, trying to, you know, and I'm running down the arena, throwing them down, no problem. But you have to be in shape, but you also have to be event-specific in shape. Yes, very, very sure. Yeah, it's like in bull riding, it's a lot with the legs and growing. It's like that'll wear you out really quick. But, yeah, it's you got to be in that sport shape, and it does take a toll on you. It's crazy. You don't use them muscles in the gym, but right. if you – if you get in there and actually work at it and focus on what muscle you're using, you can somewhat replicate it, but definitely not using the same muscles. No, and I seen you did on, on your video, which we're going to talk about that, uh, another eight seconds that 805 Beer did with you. I guess it was a buck and barrel type deal, a mighty bucky or whatever you guys call yeah. those, I'm not 100% sure. But you had a, a band on him kind of leaning forward and pulling against and resisting. It wasn't a big band. Yeah, and I watched your video, the the another eight seconds um, from 805 Beer put together for you. And, you know, talking about working those muscles, you had a band around a guy's waist and he was on the Mighty Bucky, I think is what you call it. And those are movements you can't replicate in the gym. And that little band, even though it seems small, the resistance they're getting is similar to to what they're going to feel on a bull. 
Yeah, exactly. And then that band, like you said, it's very small and little, but it's very hard to use them type of muscles in your legs. And that's the way I could describe it as, as it's just like kind of like riding bareback, but you also got to keep your legs kind of shuffling the whole time and in position and bull riding form, basically. But yeah, that, that little band will wear your legs out real quick. You'll be jello in no time. Well, and you always move, and you, I mean, and that's any sport or any event rodeo, you, you always have to be moving. If you ever get still or stagnant, you're going to hit a land on your head, or, you know, it's not going to end well for you. Exactly. No, it's, it's never good because then you're thinking and you're behind usually. Well, we talked about the athletes and seeing the, you know, the transition from 10 years ago to, to when the last time you made it. But let's talk about the Bulls because I feel like, and I love watching old videos of when the PBR started to what they're riding now. And not saying those Bulls weren't rank or hard to ride, but it seems like these suckers, it's a whole different level of Bulls. No, yeah. Like, it's just, they got a better variety of good bulls like there's so many of them out there now and the mediocre bulls are they get pushed to the side now and <laughs> everybody's got to try to ride them rank ones and the way i look what i see the most of it is the guys are getting banged up and it's taking a toll on them now and it's it's tough on them, the bull riders now just because you're getting on the high-end bulls day in and day out weekend week out because there's so many of them Back in the day, there's probably only 20 of them, and they shuffled through the weekends. But now it's there's one there, five there every weekend. It's it's tough to stay healthy. Well, here on the Luke Branquino Show, we do a segment called Rodeo Trivia. What is the minimum amount of judges used at a rodeo? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, and talking about the sport, how it's evolved. And I feel like the athletes have, but the Bulls damn sure have evolved even more. And like you said, they have breeding programs and you could have somebody that may only have two Bulls, but they spent the money invested in them that they're ranked Bulls. I mean, they got some of the best bloodlines and, you know, uh, parents that, that a person would want out of them. And so you have 100 people with two Bulls instead of, you know, 10 people with five or six bulls it's it's really grown as far as that goes with that abbi and and everything else yeah all the genetics and the bulls is crazy and how far i'd have to say hd and page has kind of set it out there for everybody for the breeding and getting everybody kind of lined out on that but yeah it's insane there's so many guys out there around down south that have 10 15 bulls but like you said they're they're ones that you're going to see on tv and they're going to freaking give it to those guys it's nuts well, and you see names attached to them, you know, of, of singers, of athletes, like, you know, NFL athletes, Major League Baseball players. And that's what the sport to me has done. It has brought that audience into it because they love everything about rodeo, everything about bull riding. They, you know, it's the last true American sport. Yeah, no, yeah, it definitely is. And it's cool to see all those celebrities and stuff like that trying to involve in the sport of rodeo and like that it's it's insane actually the one that broke my neck the first time was cole wetzel's bull <laughs> but yeah like it's they're getting so many investors out there now that right. it's and they're able to do that breeding now and dial it down to what bull or what cow they want and yeah and it's insane what they're coming up with well, you, you said it and it was going to bring me into my next question. The bull that broke your neck the first time obviously battled back and, and worked your ass off to be in the best shape, uh, the best you you could be to get back on them. And, man, you, you started from that injury to, I guess, the last one. Did you feel like that was the best Stetson Lawrence has ever been, a, been on the back of a bull? Yeah, 100% was the best there ever was of me because just because I did a lot of just little stuff to to get there because <clears throat> after I broke my neck it was it was a little tough to come back from that just because you got to play six screws in there and like if you land on it again it's not gonna work out so good but no I did a lot of a lot of therapy to be honest went to therapy just to overcome the doubts and all that stuff yeah. and then a lot of working out and just <clears throat> testing my neck out so I knew it was somewhat able to take the beating if I did land on my head. So 
I was in the gym four days a week and uh what was it the fifth day I went to yoga and in between there I, I hit a freaking therapy in there like it was I wanted it, everything to be out of the way and I wanted 100% focused in on my job just because if I didn't do it that way I sell myself short and it kind of showed off and I was I was making a run for it and making good money I was enjoying it until until it ended but oh well yeah I had a good time but to mental clarity for a neck or a spine injury like that is it's got to be huge I mean I've had dang sure my fair share of injuries and, you know, all tendons, ligaments, stuff like that, which they, they put a, a bone graph in or they put a, a button or a plug or something to, to get you stitched back together. And, you know, six months, you're ready to go again. A spinal injury, like you said, six screws and a plate in your neck. I mean, if you land on your head, it's going to break above or below that and, anything of that matter is it could be potentially life threatening. Yeah, exactly. That's just it. And I knew that going into it, but I knew I didn't want to have that doubt because I've been in the game for that long. And I've had that doubt and it's not a fun feeling when that thing's creeping up on you when you're climbing right. over the chute. So I went to therapy, got all that figured out and just figured out, figured out myself more than anything and how to control my emotions and thoughts and not, overreact and just kind of go through it and not I don't know freak out I guess don't don't get too worried about it just because I the best thing I did was trust myself because I was riding bulls for that long already and I know what I'm doing but right you know once you get hurt it's it's hard to trust the body again and it's hard to get back in that fight mode well and to that point if you for me if I back in the box with any doubt one, I wasn't going to win anything. And two, it increased your chances of getting hurt again. Oh, and yeah. in the bull ride, and I think you could magnify that by a hundred or a thousand or 10,000 just because of the situation you're putting yourself in. So you have to go into anything, whether it's the time events, rough stock, or hell life for that matter. Yeah. You have to go in with that, you know, confidence and not having any doubt to have any success. Yeah. And that was. I struggle with it a little bit, even just like going back to my earlier career, getting into short rounds. Like I just didn't, you know, it's another step up, you know, got to handle that. And it took me a couple of years to get that handled, but I knew I needed to do it and I needed some help. So that's why I went and got some advice and how to control my emotions and thoughts. And it's been a big game changer for me, honestly, other than the physical working out and all that stuff. Well, and even later in my career, because a ton of success, started getting hurt. And then, then you start, like you said, it starts creeping up on you, that doubt that is my body going to hold up? Well, I had, I went to, to Paige Champion. I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar. I'm no Paige and yeah. Champion's wife. And, you know, she was, uh, she was very instrumental in helping me, you know, block all that stuff out. She's like, well, what do you think about when you weren't getting hurt and winning? I'm like, nothing. So why are you thinking about all that stuff now? I'm like, well, okay, that makes sense. But it took, a, you know, multiple sessions with her of trying to reset my brain to back to yeah. championship form, I guess you could say. Yeah, the best way I could look, put it together is perception. Which way, how you want to look at it? Do you want to look at it as if you want sympathy or do you want to look at it as you're grinding it out and looking, chasing something? Right. Well, and that's exactly right. And for you, I'm sure, well, you may not have been like me, but it, <laughs> as cowboys, we don't want help. We don't want to ask for help. We don't want to admit that we need help. And for me to reach out, well, actually, my wife reached out for me to pay. <laughs> and I, I was, I was pushing back. I was against it because we're tough. We're stubborn. We're, you know, that's just our mentality. But yes. in all reality, if we want to be our very best, you might have to ask for help every now and again. Exactly. That's you said right there. It's hard for us cowboys to ask for help, and to want help is another thing. And to know that you need it is not easy either. But like me going into therapy, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I didn't know what to talk about or nothing. But eventually, you get going, and it just comes out, and it like it's a weight lift off your shoulder. And you're like, heck yeah, I'm gonna go compete now. I'm ready to freaking perform. It is amazing how that. It is a weight lifted off your shoulders. Um, 
But it, it, what's also amazing is how stubborn we were before we realized yeah. that there was a weight on our shoulders. <laughs> yes, yeah, just getting in there, you're like, I don't want to go. I'm, I'm, I'm all right. I don't need to yeah. do this. And then it's like afterwards, you're like, God, I'm an idiot. Why did I do this five years ago? Yeah, exactly. And, and I feel like athletes are start. I call them athletes now. Cowboys and, and athletes are starting to kind of realize that how important that mental <clears throat> side of it is, even as much so as the physical part. Yeah, like putting on these board riding schools, I've noticed that it's 90% mental. And if we get these kids to think smaller and just not have this big picture, like just think small, aim small kind of thing with my mentality, like board riding simple. You don't need to overcomplicate it. Do a couple things and just react. Yeah, that's and I think that's just the, the Western sports. You know, if, if you try to overcomplicate it, you're – you're going down a path that is hard to get back from. And that's what I felt like towards the end of my career was. And um, yeah, I just, I don't, we never did think when we were winning, I don't know why we thought we needed to start now. <laughs> yeah, no, that's just it. When you're winning, you're freaking having fun. Just enjoying it. You're not worried about nothing, but yeah. Once you start questioning and then the doubts creep in and it piles up on you and then that's when you go down the bad road. Yeah. Uh, so neck injury, C6 and C7, that was the first break. Yep. And that was how long, how long were you out with that injury before you got back on your next one? Four months. That doesn't seem like very long, but that's, yeah. that's pretty impressive. No, like to be honest, I, right before that, I had my shoulder surgery the year before and I had to sit out six months and rehab that. And that's right. that shoulder suck. I'd rather break my neck again, to be honest. It wasn't that bad for rehab. <laughs> was it your rotator cuff? Yeah. Oh, that was the worst. Mine was that out of all nine surgeries I had, I would, well, there might be a couple people I'd wish it upon. I wouldn't wish it upon <laughs> anybody because that rotator cuff surgery is horrible. Yeah. It's not fun. And it, it takes a long time to get that strength back. It sucks. Yeah. So you were four months and then how long did you go from that first bull till obviously your neck, next, 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 neck injury? The first bull I got on was in December. So I broke my first time I broke my neck was 21 in August, first week in August. And then I got back on in December of 21, like later. And then I broke it again in March of 22. So you were, it was a short amount of time. I mean, December 21 to March of 22. Yeah, I rode for like a little over two months. Wow. That was it. Uh, but it was a good two months. I rode legit 50% of my bulls and I made probably about a little over 90 grand. It was, <laughs> it was a good time. Not, not a, I guess other than breaking your neck, not a bad comeback to, to back to return to retirement. Uh, yeah. And man, I feel for you. I mean, I felt like my career, I didn't, it, I didn't go out on my terms. Um, you know, and that's, I think that is one, probably one of the hardest things for us Cowboys to, to come to, grip with you know we want to go out we want to go out on our terms i want to go out at the national finals rodeo running my last year in the 10th yeah, go around exactly. and, um didn't happen uh i'm i'm sure you were the same way yeah no i was like i said i was doing good that year and i think i was sitting six in the world when i actually had to retire it was it sucked because that was probably the highest i've been and like you said i wanted to at least get to that year the world finals and Bale was put that in my freaking chapter. Be like, okay, got that done. But now, like you said, I, I think every guy gets cut short because it's just rodeo and bull riding. And you never know what's going to happen. Right. Yeah. And <clears> I, <throat> so, like, like for me, I blew my hamstring out. And actually, it was June of 21, blew my hamstring. And obviously, I'd, I could still walk. So I was trying to compete. And at that time, I think I was third in the world. So I took a month off rehabbed and came back and had a great 4th of July run. I think I won 13 grand over the 4th, won St. Paul and placed a couple other ones. And then from that point on, it was just the downhill slide. And um, after, uh, I guess, Amarillo in September, it finally gave us a, the scar tissue had attached to the sciatic nerve. And when that busted loose in September, that was probably some of the worst I had. And, and I knew, I was like, you know what? I'm going to have this fixed and I'm, and I'm done. 
And that was hard. And I honestly didn't tell myself, I, I told myself I was done, but I didn't believe it for another year. You know, I had surgery, rehab, and then, you know, that was a hard, that was a hard road trip because Lindsay was writing up my retirement speech. And I was crying like a damn baby. Blabbing. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, as well as anybody that telling, admitting to the world, much less yourself is probably one of the hardest things we ever have to do. Yeah. It's, it's tough. It's like you said, you guys say goodbye to something you cherish and love. And for me, it was like, shoot, that's, that's how I made my living. Now I got to rethink and I was good at it. Like I didn't, <laughs> what am I going to do now? Exactly. Now what am I going to do? And most, I don't know, most bull riders, most rodeo people don't have a degree and all that stuff. And, you know, you got to start back from scratch, but now it's, I look back at it and it was, I went back to therapy again, honestly, because after I got told, because it happened in Arlington, and I went back to see the specialist just to double check. Because after I landed on my head, I couldn't feel nothing for a while. And then Tandy was like, you better go get it checked out just to make sure. So I was in Dallas, and that's where I had the surgery done. And I went to him, and he's like, yeah, man, you, you need to be done. Like, you've dodged two bullets like the Matrix because above my fusion – the spinal column's about like that big and the refracture was in the fusion of C6 and C7. Like I refractured that fusion. So I didn't have to wear a neck brace anymore, but then he's like, yeah, like if you hit your head anymore, like you're, you're going to be paralyzed from the ears down, not just dang. But we are still doing, I mean, I'm doing clinics. I'm, you know, same as you doing clinics, helping out at the college with MSU there in Bozeman, helping the, the rodeo team and the bull riders Um, so we, it'll never, we'll never get away from it, which I don't think we'll ever want to No, And, and being able to give back to the sport we love. I mean, it's, it's not quite as sweet as being in the arena winning, but it is still pretty cool when you could say, Hey, I helped that kid or that kid's, they come to you for advice. Yeah, no, exactly. That's just it. I got this one college kid from California and he just come to college wanting to ride bulls, just starting off green as he can. And now they're starting to figure it out and get some rides and it's pretty cool to see them develop and actually get out there and succeed. And you're like, heck yeah, I helped that guy. Yeah, that is, a, that's an awesome feeling. And uh, being able to watch the future and help the future of the sport grow is, it's pretty cool. Let's talk about um, some bulls you conquered because I know there's a couple of them that hadn't been ridden before and you, you went ahead and stomped them and got some points on them. What, what were some of the best bull rides that you, if your career you, you can remember oh shoot probably the best the high score one i ever had was on Cochise. there it was 92 that was a good sucker just a big bull out there around left and yeah once you got to the spin it's pretty easy and it was nice i almost rode him the next weekend after that too but he bucked me off at seven i got got a little too spur happy i got a little too aggressive and he got you proud. yeah exactly um Mind Freak was another one. Mind Freak was the one I rode that nobody else rode yet. Yeah, it was right. like 21 ounce or so. The funny thing about that was I didn't even know that was a thing. And I was actually almost getting cut off tour. And I was 15th going into the short round. And I just ended up having to ride him to stay on. And after I rode him, they're like, eh, nobody's rode him. I'm like, oh, well. I did. I did, I guess. Was that was that when the draft, like if you were 15th coming back to the short round, everybody went and picked the bull and he was left for you? That was the one they left for you? Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was like, oh, well, I'll take that one because the other one was pretty arm jerker heavy, not, not the one you want to get on. And one of the younger kids, I can't remember who it was, but they picked him because they knew the other bull wasn't ridden. And I'm like, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no joke. So that, that ride kept you back on tour then? Yeah, I was sitting like a 32 and then outride there, bumped me back up so I didn't have to get cut. Huh. It's amazing how those things work out. I mean, out of sight, out of mind, didn't know that he hadn't been ridden and then then ride him. And <clears throat> I don't, did you win that event come from 15th or? Heck no. I think, <laughs> who was it? Somebody rode Bruiser or Black. Big Black, one of the good bulls that I was riding. Yeah, they they beat me. I was sitting first to like the last three guys. I can't remember who it was, but yeah, they beat me. Huh. Well, I guess with that draft in your own bull, it makes it easier if you're coming in first. I mean, other than J.B. Mooney, I feel like he'd always pick, you know, Bushwhacker or something like that. But a lot of those other yeah. guys, I would tell you was, I'm going to get one I get a score on and hopefully get the W. 
that's that was my mentality. Well, he always had JB. He'd take Bushwhacker anyway, so you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> so I was uh, like, yeah, I'll just get one I ride. Yeah, if there was something that nobody wanted, JB would be the one that picked him. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, there's me and him. Actually, me and him were the last two one time coming in. I was one before him. He was the last guy. He's like, which one do you want? He's like, that one. Like, All right. Sounds good. He's the worst one. <laughs> I was like, perfect. Did he ride him? No, we both bucked that. <laughs> oh, JB, he's he's one of a kind. But that, you know, that mentality of uh, – I th- Obviously, you guys had similar mentality because I think if he thought he can go get back on bulls with broken neck, he would. But similar yeah. injury than as yours, I'd imagine, huh? Yeah, it's pretty close, I think. And it's yeah, it's a I don't know. Once you screw up your spine, it's I don't know, you you don't, exactly. And I'm I think most cowboys are pretty independent. I don't like being pushed around. I wouldn't like want that feeling. So I had enough good time in the arena. And I enjoyed it, so it's a good time to step away. That's why I look at it, and I just keep reminding myself because there's times I want to get back on them, but yeah. it's not worth it. No, no. I mean, I, well, you're. I see you stepping around them, kind of fighting bulls in the practice bin. <laughs> well, that ain't even worth it. No, I, I, I get some close, but I don't get that close. Like I think I'm close, but I'm still four feet away. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah still too close for me i need to be up on the back of the bucket shooter on the fence and then i'm still probably not far enough away from those suckers yeah what about traveling partners i know you know in in our business getting in with a group of guys that you could feed off of it is huge who are some of the guys you traveled with that helped you to the success you had oh shoot for the first couple of years i was on tour it was like me Nathan Shopper, J.W. Harris, and Aaron Roy would all kind of stay in a room together. That was quite the wild crew there for a while. <laughs> but, yeah, you learned a lot from them guys. And like we said, they push you and you want to, like, everybody wants to be better. or You don't want to be the losing guy in a group, you know. Right. So those guys kind of dindled doodled out of their careers and then I ended up getting in with Derek Kobaba and Jess Lockwood for a long time and those two guys were fun and kept me young yeah that's I mean and that makes a big difference you get in with a younger group of guys like that it it helps your spirit and like you said keeps you young exactly yeah those two kept me young and I enjoyed it, helping them out a little bit and and like I said they helped me out keeping me young and just I don't know like you said like keeping an eye like a perception on everything like yeah look it through as you're just getting back in the group again and getting back in the on tour again not damn i gotta get on the road again yeah no that's exactly right well cole baba you guys traveled he broke his neck what his it was his injury similar to yours or different or i mean pretty somewhat close like his wasn't as bad to begin with but i think he didn't wear his brace or something Something with his rehab, I think he over- pushed it too hard or something. And then he had to go back and actually have surgery. Oh. Like, it wasn't surgery necessary right away. Then he kind of rehabbed. And I don't know if he was lifting too much weights or something. It wasn't healing right. And then he had to go back and get surgery. But, yeah, basically, his ain't terribly – I think his is lower. Mm. So it can – like basically, that's how mine was. Like, the C7, the 5 is – you can kind of still ride, but – if you get up in the four and three, that's where it's very detrimental. It's closer to that brain stem. Yeah, it's not good. Yeah. Is he uh, – he's ready to go again now? Is he back on tour and then? Yeah, he's he's on the Carolina Cowboys team there. He's He just got on, I think it was last week, his first bull back. Gotcha. Yeah, so he's he's ready to come back. And, yeah, he's, I hope he does good and, shoot, wins a lot of money for those guys. Yeah, he's been impressive to watch in his career. And, um, you know, obviously having a, a veteran travel with you helps helps a lot. Um, let's talk about another eight seconds. Uh, 805 Beer did this documentary on you, and uh, you had an awesome guy filming it, Keith Malloy, great family, family friends, him and Chris, his brother, and actually the whole family. But um, how neat was that to be able to kind of get your story out there uh, to to the world? Oh, it was very neat. It was awesome that the 805 were wanted to do it and agreed to do it with me. And 
yeah, Keith did an amazing job on putting it all together and telling the story. He's he's a great guy and shoot, yeah, it's just I don't <laughs> I didn't think it'd be well, that well put together, but that guy will bring you up and cut you down pretty good. <laughs> it's it's funny you say that because uh, Yeti did one on me. Uh, I guess it was the first year they picked me up, and his brother Chris was uh, did it for him, and. We, as Cowboys, we don't realize what it takes to put one of those videos together. And I mean, no. there was a crew and this is, I mean, it was snapped out like this and it has to be done this way. It was, it was pretty impressive to, uh, to see it at the same time. I was like, wow, this is way too intense for me. Yeah. There's a lot more behind the scenes there to put one of those things on. Like you said, there, they, Keith had like three guys come out to my grandparents ranch here in South Dakota and they had all their cameras and gadgets there. My my family is like, whoa, what's going on here? Because they never – all they see is a little video camera before, right. nothing like that. And, yeah, it's it's insane. They did a great job, and, you know, those guys are good people, and it's awesome. Yeah, they it's professional. They do awesome work and, and make some great stuff. I know they – I've watched other videos that they've done for people, and they are – they're legit on what they do, and – um, but again, to have that story put out there, and I know it's, I think you can watch it on YouTube now. Uh, yeah. And, and, uh, I think it looked like it had quite a few views already and it just got released not that long ago. Right. Last I think a week now, it's been yeah. a, maybe a little over a week. Well, it'll just keep gaining traction, which you know, as well as I do, anybody that's retired from rodeo, if you can keep gaining traction on your, you know, yourself, you're doing pretty darn good. Heck yeah. And, no, I, I appreciate those guys doing it and yeah they did a great job and it's it's getting out there and i don't know if you get out there and watch it she just be inspired basically exactly. don't give up on your dreams because if you got a if you got some goals out there just get a plan set up and chase after them suckers because life's short Life short, but you've had a hell of a support system. I watching the video, your family 100% behind you. Now you got a baby girl, what, 16 months old, right yep. around there. So, I mean, it's just your support system's getting bigger. It is. It is very big. And having a little girl around, man, that's you never, you never know where someone loves you so much having your own kids like that. It's nuts. That's that's the truth. I got, but it goes by fast, man. I got three of them, and our oldest is going to be sixteen. Then we got a fourteen-year-old and and uh, eight-year-old man, and and all three of them boys. They're they're growing like weeds, and it goes by fast. So enjoy it. Yes, sir. Now I've already kind of experienced it going by fast. The first year is like holy cow, it just felt like three months went by, but here we are. That's it. Well, well, Stetson, I appreciate you coming on the show, man. It was great catching up with you again and uh, best of luck in the future and, and looking forward to all those students you're, you're teaching and seeing them in the bright lights. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me on and take care. You too. Thanks, Stetson. Well, here on the Luke Branquino Show, we do a segment called Rodeo Trivia. What is the minimum amount of judges used at a rodeo? The minimum is two, but a lot of these rodeos, especially the bigger ones with more added money, will have upwards of six. Hey, you want to see more in-depth details on the Luke Branquino Show? Make sure you like and subscribe.